Five. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, our abstract-based workshop. If you are not familiar with how the uh, what the format of the workshop is, we will have five separate speakers. Their presentations are pre-recorded, and after the pre-recorded session, we will have uh, about eight minutes of live question and answers. So, if you would like to use the the Slido tool to ask questions, we will be receiving those in the chat box and be able to ask our speakers. Uh, live questions after their presentation. Our first speaker is Cheyenne Pai, and she will be discussing telehealth versus face-to-face -face education uh, for her RT patients. Hello, my name is Cheyenne Pai. I'm a pediatric cystic fibrosis respiratory therapist and program coordinator at Dell Children's Medical Center of Central Texas in Austin. I will be presenting our center's abstract title, Telehealth versus Face-to-Face -face Annual Respiratory Education for Pediatric Outpatient Cystic Fibrosis Clinic Visits. Poster number 261. This abstract will be highlighting patient options of face-to-face -face versus telehealth visits for cystic fibrosis annual respiratory education. We will discuss patient preference or method of education as well as the tools used to present education in both in-person and telehealth visits. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. Educating patients on their annual education during clinical visits became challenging as COVID-19 pandemic continued to evolve. Respiratory therapists, therapists investigated using telehealth alternatives to face-to-face -face interactions for annual respiratory education. The center's care aim was to reach at least 60% of the patient population for patient education and to evaluate patient feedback to determine which approach best meets their needs. So we asked at these annual respiratory education patients and family, how do you like to receive your respiratory education? Telehealth versus face-to-face. -face. Prior to March 2020, all respiratory education was done at the face-to-face -face clinic visits. The educator utilizes a laminated flip chart at these face-to-face -face clinics. Patients can take pictures of these educational content during these education reviews. The respiratory therapist recognizes a continued need for similar method for respiratory education tool for these telehealth visits. The laminated flip chart was converted to PowerPoint presentation slides for the telehealth visits. Using the screen share option, the staff was able to educate the patients with the same material. The patients and family members were able to take pictures, screenshots, and have informational slides emailed to them. At the telehealth visits, the respiratory therapist can see the patient's home respiratory equipment setup. The patients can demonstrate their respiratory treatments, airway clearance, or troubleshoot issues concurrently with the slide. As shown here, we're doing home spirometry with the patient. The respiratory therapists later perform a post-survey interview to all educated patients and families in regards to their education experience and preference. We were able to meet our goal of 60% completion by November 2020 and exceeded to 91% by the end of February 2021. Of the 160 patients that participated, 35% were educated in face-to-face, -face, which you can see that in blue, and 65 of the patients were done via telehealth, which you can see in red. And when we asked them if they prefer having their annual respiratory education via face-to-face -face or telehealth, we got these following results. 49% patient prefer completing their annual respiratory education assessment in face-to-face -face clinic, which is depicted in blue, and 51% of patients preferred it via telehealth, which is here in red. As you can see, this is almost a pretty even split. Let's break down the results even further. 
Patients and family that prefer the telehealth visits describe the reasons for their preference as shorter time in clinic, no traveling, and improved safety. They also like the screen sharing technology, ease of managing young children or multiple children, ability to show their home equipment setup, ability to see the staff's face because we're not wearing ease on screen, and it's less expensive for some. Looking at the face-to-face -face population, their preference is because they're more focused and physically present. And there's the ability for the caretakers and staff to perform physical procedures and demonstrations. They also like the in-person uh, staff connection during these visits. Also, there's less information technology issues. And some of them didn't um, want to provide any feedback. So in conclusion, patients and family now have the options of choosing how they would like to complete their respiratory education moving forward. Having annual cystic fibrosis respiratory education materials available for both face-to-face -face and telehealth clinics allow for effective communication and share knowledge for the patients and families. Analysis of post-education survey did not yield a statistical preference, but individual patients and family chooses one method over the other, providing clear reasons for their preference. Therefore, the respiratory therapist will adopt and continue to offer both platforms to meet, best meet the individual needs of the patients. We hope you find this presentation to be helpful as we proceed in these rapid, challenging, and changing times. We're providing additional education reference and further reading for you, and we'd like to thank the Dell Children's Specialty Care Center Pediatric Cystic and Fibrosis Program and the illustrator of the poster of Baby and Park. Please feel free to contact us if you have any further questions. We want to thank you for your attention. We wish you the best. Live. Okay, we are live with our Q&A now. Um, Shine in, make sure that you uh, un unmute yourself so that we can hear you. And um, I'd like to thank you for not only a great presentation, but something that's really um, very timely right now, because uh, I mean, we're doing this virtually, which kind of uh, shows us that we're still in the midst of uh, maybe not seeing patients like we normally, uh, normally do. So I will uh, jump into uh, some of the questions that we've got in our chat box. And uh, the first question is one that I think is uh, really awesome. It was one that I was gonna ask myself. And that was, uh, did you ask your staff whether they, preferred FaceTime to uh, virtual education. And my thought is just uh, basically what did they think of uh, their contact with that virtual education? So there's not really a lot of staff to survey considering that there's just myself and another respiratory therapist. So there's a survey of N equals two. <laughs> um, but that being said, we had a very different approach on what was best for us whether it be telehealth versus um, in person. Um, my colleague does all our PFTs and she prefers in person. Obviously we have the materials, the equipment, um, and it's much easier to see and coach and make sure they have proper technique for the PFT. So for her in person is definitely, I would say best. However, you know, under the circumstances, we were very uh, fortunate and glad that we had the home spirometers. For me, I usually do the education piece. And I have to say finding the uh, telehealth helpful was that I don't think I've ever seen so many patients rooms in like one year. <laughs> and instead of like having to find it to be in clinic, like, well, I kind of does this, I kind of do that. I mean, they literally take the camera and put it where they need to and point and sh do show and tell. And that was so much easier for me um, as far as like helping them make sure everything fits, making sure that everything's set up, like don't put your compressor next to the curtains. No wonder it's heating up because it's sucking up the curtain, you know, which I would never have known that if I didn't have the video um, um, and having, you know, to be able to see how they have everything done properly. And they're even actually able to demonstrate some of this stuff without having to lug all that equipment to clinic to show it to me. So in, in the education piece, I do see the benefit of the telehealth. That's, that's awesome. Some of that I, I never really uh, 
thought of the aspect of seeing them. Um, another good question is, uh, did you have a, a patient preference uh, for telehealth versus in-person based on the age of the patients? That is, I would say, not my preference, but we did do a poll. And I have to say, all my teenagers do prefer the telehealth. They're very <laughs> computer savvy. They're probably better than most of their parents or grandparents in that sense. So, and they don't have to miss as much school. Um, I mean, they can just pop in and pop out. And, um, and they were very good at, you know, discussing their treatments and everything with us, you know, over um, telehealth. However, I did say that on my, one of my surveys for the little ones, it was quite difficult. I mean, they were all over the place. I mean, you, you can't, you can't contain them. Um, but that's good in the sense that they weren't tired of the long visit because they are in their own comfortable environment. So they could run around, but it's just really hard to keep them in front of the camera for a long period of time. Sure. Um, there is a question about being able to uh, share your flip chart of education. Um, oh. I, and I, I know she had some emails. Uh, so the, the flip chart, you can actually find that in education tool. So if you go to our resources in our CF Foundation resources under education, it's actually already in there. Our, and you can, it's probably a little outdated because we, we do update it, you know, um, every other year with the newest stuff. But I think you could probably use the gist of it, the framework, and then, you know, change it as needed for your center. Outstanding. So that's available through the foundation's websites. Yeah, the website, the Port CF Education tab, or you can go under resources and in, um, in the, the, for, the portal. Um, and this is a, a good question. Did you have any uh, patients that had challenge accessing telehealth or maybe patients you had to exclude from telehealth from your population because they didn't have access? Yes, we did have a couple of those. Um, we did have some that were just uh, not able to get online with us. So those are very difficult. Um, we did have to, you know, maneuver with phone calls, but those are very rare. I think I would just say I could probably count them on my fingers for those. Um, most people have a smartphone. So, yeah, some kind of device of some kind. And it, it was help, it was helpful, especially for the ones that have to travel extremely far from us. Sure. Um, the drive time was uh, was definitely cut away and it was mm -hmm. nice, but we just maybe had like one Z or two Z that was um, challenging with connection, um, with the IT of how to get in and get on. Um, however, you know, uh, we were some of, we had somebody walk them through it over the phone. And to be honest, a lot of time at the end, it was the young patient that was IT Savage that got the parents connected. <laughs> so um, it really surprising. worked out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, an interesting question as well, uh, that it says, you know, you had a, you noted a preference uh, for uh, virtual did you notice a difference in knowledge ret retention between the in-person versus the virtual groups? Um, I haven't done a, a survey for that one recently. We did do, we might, we might do it in the future, but we have done one in the past. I would say probably not because when they're in person, um, we tell them to use our smartphone and take pictures of the flip chart material. We don't do okay. handouts because we, they tend to like throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, on their way out of clinic, or, or it gets lost. But uh, with What's technology, on the table in clinic. <laughs> right? And then so with technology, they're able to take pictures of the flip chart because we make it pretty big. Um, and then with the telehealth, what's really nice is that not only can they take pictures, they can also do screenshots um, of the same material. And that was actually, you know, kind of the similar thing, you know, whether it be with your phone or with a screen, it's, it's saved for them, you know, digitally. So that has been really nice and retaining because I've had, um, parents who, uh, show it to me on their phone, like, well, this is what it says. And it was helpful because we took it with us when we were inpatient and showed it to the traveling respiratory therapist that wasn't CF savvy. Sure. And they were able to use that. So um, in that sense, it's been uh, really nice. Good. Um, and we have a, a question about uh, Spanish speaking patients. I know we have uh, quite a few in, in my center. Um, and they're asking if was it more difficult to do telehealth versus inpatient because of uh, language barrier. So I live in Austin, Texas. We have a quite a bit of Hispanic, uh, Spanish speaking population. And what our institution was able to have is that we can call in a interpreter that hops on telehealth with us for the whole entire clinic. 
So in that sense, they were right there, just like you and I are, you know, shared screen side by side um, to be able to translate for us. And a lot of my material also in Spanish. So even though I don't read Spanish well, I know what I wrote. So I can sort of point and they can read it along with us because of, of that. That was uh, um, extremely helpful for us in that sense. Um, of, co of course, you know, there are certain things that are obviously still easier in person like PFTs and so on and so forth. But as far as the um, literature education and the flip charts, I, I don't see a big difference between um, what we have, you know, in person versus telehealth. And we also have other um, patients that don't speak Spanish or English and actually speak other languages. And we're able to have interpreters on with us as well for those. Excellent. Um, and one of the questioners uh, is asking, do you, do you bill for your visits? And uh, did you incorporate these with other um, disciplines in telehealth visits or was it strictly RT? So did this kind of come on the heels or associate with uh, doctors, social work? I mean, are you okay. going to bill for that? I'm going to be really transparent honest. As far as billing, my knowledge is not as uh, robust. So, however, we do bill like a telehealth visit. So it's uh, under the same encounter, as you would say, for a telehealth uh, bill. Um, the, I do know there's a difference in the fact that if they're in person, we do have a facility piece of the billing and they don't have that in a telehealth. I don't know what the number difference is, you know, with all the logistics of it, but we are still billed under the physician with that whole in, encounter. Um, just like telehealth visits, we do have intake in the beginning um, of each visit to ask who they need to see, what needs they have, um, and so they know which disciplines to, that they need to see. Also, we also have preclinic visits uh, where we discuss which providers um, and staff need to see them as well. And with those two combination, um, we are able to have multidisciplinary care in a telehealth as well as in person. Um, as far as um, Asynchronized. Once in a while, we do follow up separately, but it's it's when I say separately, it's still probably within that two three days. You know, for example, um, our uh, respiratory therapist may get that in home spirometry reading um, maybe twelve hours before the clinic, so that we would have that data for the physician, and it would make that visit a lot smoother and a lot faster. Um, as well as also our social workers sometimes if we're dealing with assistant programs, they might do a follow-up call or visits with them um, if something came up that we couldn't address right away in that clinic visit. So there is a, a asynchronized as well as synchronized piece to all of it for all of us. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any new questions on the board. I'm not sure how long we've been answering questions for. I'm hoping somebody's going to tell me when the, uh, when the eight minutes is up. I didn't set a timer. Um, is there anything uh, that you'd like to add before they tell us we're out of time? I think that, that this uh, is important. We, I think pretty much everybody CF center wise is probably doing a lot more remote learning, remote education, telehealth uh, with the pandemic. So I think it's a really timely topic. And I appreciate you putting all that together. No, I appreciate you guys inviting me. I do think that even though this was challenging for all of us, the last, you know, 20 months or so, um, I do have to say there are a lot of new innovation that did come through with the whole thing. Um, we did have these other choices for our patients prior to the pandemic, and now they do. And we, and the fact that now I, like we can see inside their home and see their setup, that's so much like more opening that for, for questions, for concerns, for care, for improvement of everything. So um, I guess, you know, you make, Lemonade out of lemons. So. Yeah. And I think when you say uh, seeing inside their houses and seeing where they do their therapy at, um, that really stands out to me because um, a few years ago, I attended a, a, at the CF conference, a talk where they discussed beginning telehealth, of course, way before the pandemic. And everybody was like, wow, that's, that's really, you know, novel. And nobody's ever thought of that. But one of the things that they discussed was that they could actually see um, where their patients do their therapy, what their setup is like, and just offer some really good uh, tips on how to shave time and do um, uh, just more efficient treatments just from, from simply seeing their setup. And I thought that's really, really important to, uh, to, to stress. 
Um, one questioner is asking, do you know if PT is doing any telehealth visiting or so? So our center couldn't do PT because of billing. However, um, last year when we did NACFC, I did hear of some PT that could bill for telehealth. So it seems like it's a mixed bag that I'm aware of um, for PT. So, um, but as far as our center was concerned, we, we couldn't do uh, PT telehealth, but they did, but they were able to call and just check up on them. But I don't think that was a, as significant as if they were able to see them in person. Okay. And, um, uh, we are at the end of our time, Shine Ann, so I'm going to let you go. Um, Thank our you. next speaker is Dion Adair, and her abstract talk is on uh, assessing the utility of an outpatient exercise program in pediatric CF patients. Um, this is their big QI project. So, uh, Adair? Good day, everyone. My name is Dion Adair. And I'll be presenting on behalf of a group from the Pediatric CF Center at the University of Michigan. And this talk is based on a recently completed quality improvement project entitled Assessing the Utility of an Outpatient Exercise Program for Children with CF. I have no disclosures. So for this talk, I will do a little bit of background and then I'll talk about the actual project itself in terms of the goals, how we implemented it, what we found, and finally some key points. So we know that people with CF are generally weaker than their age match peers for multiple reasons, including disuse atrophy because they're not as physically active as they could be and underlying inflammation. So understanding this, we wanted to first quantify the weakness in our population, and then we wanted to come up with a way of improving their overall physical strength. If we were to measure muscle strength in each individual group, this would turn out to be quite technically challenging. So what we did was we used hand grip strength. And hand grip strength is a, really a surrogate for physical strength and even lean body mass. And it's a really easy and feasible way of uh, assessing physical strength in a clinic setting. So hand grip strength measures the maximum force generated by the forearm muscles. And for our project, we measured in kilograms. Measurement really involves squeezing this device here called a hand dynamometer. And usually we have individuals repeatedly do measurements, um, typically three trials on the left hand, three trials on the right hand. And then we compare the values that we get to a reference table that's based on age and gender. So grip strength not only looks at forearm muscle strength, but it turns out it's associated with other muscle groups throughout the body, such as back and leg strength. And there's even been studies in children that have shown us that grip strength correlates well with total muscle strength. Hand grip strength is also associated with FEV1. And in studies in young adults and adults with underlying conditions, it has been shown to be a predictor of lung function. We know that people with CF who have a lower fat-free mass or a lower lean body mass has lower mean FEV1% predicted. We've seen these in studies. So it follows that if hand grip strength correlates with lean body mass, then it should also correlate with FEV1% predicted as well. And we saw this in our own population in a preliminary study that led up to this current project in which we saw a significant association between hand grip strength and percent predicted FEV1. And this didn't matter um, based on the person's BMI. So across all BMI percentiles, we saw the same association. So what about our home exercise project? We utilized high intensity interval training for the project. And we chose this because we were already offering it in our inpatient setting. So when kids are admitted, we would often give them bouts of HIIT exercises to help engage the muscles and it also augment airway clearance. And HIIT workouts are really nice because they are really a time efficient way of working out. And we thought that might appeal to our CF population who baseline have a ton of other things going on, such as lots of airway clearance that competes with for their time. So the idea was we were gonna translate this HIIT program to the outpatient setting to address the problem of muscle weakness. 
So globally, we wanted to improve body strength, but specifically, we wanted to improve hand grip strength by 10% after six months participation in the program. So for our project, we use a series of PDSA cycles, and I'll go into these on subsequent slides. So for the first cycle, we took our patients between 12 to 18 years and we measured grip strength. And we wanted to identify those who are relatively weak or as defined by a grip strength less than the 50th centile. And we chose this population because we thought they were going to be more likely to do those higher intensity exercises. And what we found was that 40% of our people, or roughly 40%, were actually having a grip strength less than 50th centile. So this was the population that we provided the program to. So HIIT exercises really is uh, bouts of activity alternating with bouts of rest or bouts of our lower intensity exercises. And usually it's done within a one-to-one -one ratio. However, if a person's fitness level is suboptimal, you can actually change that ratio. So we did that for a lot of our people with CF. And you can measure the intensity of exercises several ways that are highlighted here. For our project, we use metabolic equivalence, which is a method of dividing exercises into light, moderate, or more vigorous activity, and is based on the youth activity compendium. Yeah. So I talked a little bit about this earlier, but the benefits in CF people are numerous. Uh, you can do more intense exercise in a shorter period compared to, for example, running on a treadmill for an hour. And these are roughly comparable. So you can reduce uh, the burden of care for our people with CF. And I mentioned already that you can maximize airway clearance, of course, when paired with half coughing. So to implement the project, we asked people to do five minutes of warm up, followed by about 24 minutes of HIIT exercises. So we basically gave them a list of exercises and allowed them to mix and match um, based on their preference. But we asked them to divide it into similar um, groups, such as leg day, arm day, etc. And we asked them to do this two to three times per week, at, in the very least. So our project kind of coincided with the onset of the pandemic. So though initially we wanted to assess grip strength every three months at their regular scheduled visits, at, with the onset of the pandemic, people really weren't turning up for a clinic. So what we ended up doing was we asked our physical therapist to contact these individuals to see how the program was doing or was going over the pandemic. And what we found was that there was poor adherence to the HIIT program overall. However, we were able to encourage some individuals to start doing some um, amount of regular physical activity. And it turned out that people were choosing to do more aerobic activities such as running, walking, swimming, playing basketball, et cetera. So instead of having them try to do the HIIT program, we ask them, hey, continue to do what you're doing, but do it on a regular basis. And we made plans for a third cycle uh, to assess what was going on with the program thereafter. So luckily, as the pandemic rolled on, people were feeling more comfortable with coming in to see us. And so we were able to get a proportion of patients back in. So we evaluated our grip strength and we also checked adherence to the program at that point. And what we found was that people who participated in at least moderate activity recorded statistically significant improvements in grip strength. So to some kind of summarize our results, we had about 40 people that were eligible for the program based on having a group strength less than the 50th centile. And 30 of those individuals came back to clinic for a second assessment. Only two people participated in the program and one stopped after some time because they found the exercises quite difficult. Of the 30 people that came back, we included just over half of those individuals because those were the individuals who could really qualify what they were doing at baseline and at follow-up and were continuing to participate in a regular activity. And then from that group, we had to eliminate another four individuals because they were started on Trikafta after their baseline measurements. So when we looked at the baseline characteristics of the group, the mean age was about 15 years. And individuals generally, on average, had normal BMIs and normal BMI percentiles, as well as lung function. 
However, despite having normal BMIs, we saw that individuals were quite weak with a AGS percentile or absolute grip strength percentile about the 90th um, centile. Around 70% of our people were already on highly effective modulators and about 30% or nine individuals indicated that at the time of baseline assessment, they were already doing some form of moderate activity. So when we compared visit one and visit two, we saw that there was statistically significant improvement in not only group strength, but also group strength percentile with percent change of 11.7 and 51.9% respectively. In contrast, there was no improvement in the BMI or the FEV 1% predicted. So we took it a step further and we divided the groups into two groups. We had a stable activity group, which were those individuals who told us at baseline they were already doing moderate activity and at follow up were continuing to do that activity versus an increased activity group, which were those individuals who were doing nothing at baseline. And we were successful in encouraging them to do some activity such that at the follow up visit, they were doing moderate um, physical exercise. So when we looked at both groups, the time to follow up was similar across the groups. The group strength was lower in the increased activity group, which was expected as these were the folks that weren't doing anything at baseline. Um, but both groups recorded improvements in their group strength and their group strength percentile. But if you look at the group strength percentile, we saw that there was a more robust improvement in the increased activity group where if you compare these two rows, you can see that there was almost a 70% improvement in their group strength percentile versus a 43% improvement in the stable activity group. Again, we didn't see any improvements in the BMI or the lung function. So to summarize, 40% of our people with CF were relatively weak. All. We tried to implement this HIP program, um, which was unsuccessful. However, we were able to encourage some children to start some activity. And most of those who continued to do activity or started activity showed improvement in their grip strength. We didn't see any significant change in the BMI, nor did we see any change in the lung function. And we think that is probably due to our limitations, which um, are highlighted here. We had short and reduced follow-up time because of the pandemic, uh, which led to a smaller num number of people in our project. And possibly this is one of the reasons we didn't see any statistically significant improvement. And uh, majority of our people were already, or were started on Trikafta in and about three months of beginning the project. So we recognize that this could have been a confounder However, we tried to mitigate this as much as possible by eliminating those four kids who were started on it after the baseline assessment. We didn't analyze people that were, in, uh, were participating in light activity and potentially even these people would have recorded some change. So key points uh, here are that people with CFR are weak and we have proven that over and over. Group strength can help us to assess their weakness in the clinic setting, and then we can use this information to encourage them to participate in at least moderate activity, which we know can help improve their physical strength and potentially even improve their lung function. So I'd like to acknowledge the remainder of my team members from our CF Center in Michigan, and these are Ahmad Heidel, Dr. Amy Philbron, our physical therapist, Chris Topley, our, our RDs, Sandra Boma and Courtney Iwaniki, and Dr. Sami Nasser. Thank you. You are live. Excellent. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Deanna Dare live for the Q&A. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, putting in all that hard work. It looks like a lot of data was collected. And uh, I know at the beginning you said it was a QI project. And uh, um, even though your one slide says that the implementation of a high intensity interval training uh, program failed, you, your success was actually getting patients to do things. And that's kind of like my point about QI is that, uh, you know, it gives us a lot of opportunities to uh, expand on what our original idea is and, and get some kind of success no matter uh, um, no matter what. So I'm going to get right to the, the, uh, the chat box and answer or ask some of these questions. 
And um, the first question is, what did you use as a standard measure of grip strength for your comparison? So was there like a control or a normal, uh, I believe is what this question is about. So we, part of the project that we did previously um, from our center, we were able to use the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys data, grip strength data that they collect. We use two cycles of that and we um, tabulated that and, and formulated a sort of reference table. So that was what we used to determine a person's grip strength percentile um, and compare based on person's age. So we use those two cycles as or um, to make a reference data population. Awesome. I, I didn't know there was a, a national reference for hand grip strength. That's interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your uh, the program that you tried to uh, to get going, the uh, high intensity interval training, um, things that you tried to do to make it more fun, uh, rest, amount of rest, uh, amount of work ratios, that type of thing. Sure. So for the project, um, like I mentioned in the slide, we asked them to do a little bit of warm up. And then we gave them basically a, a list of things that they could do. So that included, it, it included weight bearing exercises and it included more aerobic type things. So things like jumping jacks or they could do squats, um, that type of thing. So there was an entire list of things that the patients could pick from and then they could combine those things. So it's it was some aerobic type things that were higher intensity like jumping jacks, there's also burpees on there, then there's squats, and then there's a little bit of um, light weightlifting, that type of thing. And then we combine, they could combine those exercises together. Um, and then what we, what we did was that we asked them to do these eight different exercises in one 24 minute session. But in between, we had them do the, what's called the 15 count breathlessness uh, count. So they were able to, um, and that's that count is basically you ask a patient to take a deep breath in and then you ask them to count to 15 and you would see how long um, it would take them to, to um, basically finish counting. So they would do that at rest and then they would do that after each exercise and then they'd get a sense of how quickly they're returning to a quote unquote normal, their normal. Um, so they were doing that in between each exercise. Uh, so that's how we were kind of able to, that, that was a rest period that we asked them to do. Excellent. Um, this uh, is a, an interesting question. Did, uh, did you keep track of the type of uh, activities that the remaining uh, 17 participants engaged in that they chose over the, the interval program um, that, that they, you know, that the things that they could do, the, the, the cycling or, or you know, walking, that type of thing. Yeah. So majority of the patients uh, were doing walking and like light jogging. A lot of people are doing bicycling as well. Um, there, it was coinciding up to about the, the springtime. So uh, some people started to engage in other outdoor activities. We saw a little bit of swimming as well. Um, so those were the kind of activities that people are doing. We even had a few people that would mentioned that they were doing lawn mowing and things like that. So we counted all of that as, as moderate activity based on how intense and the length of which they were doing the activity. Did you use the same type of uh, assessing, uh, you know, if it made them out of breath, what their workload was doing these activities, kind of like you did in your interval program? Yep, pretty much, yeah. And then... Um, were patients billed for like a PT consult? Uh, is, was there, were you able to do that? Well, not that I know of. I don't think we were billing because what ended up happening was the initial, um, the initial encounter, he would be able to bill. But then subsequently, we were doing a lot of phone calls and things to kind of check on people. So that part definitely, I know, wasn't being built per se, but I believe the initial encounter was built because it would have been part of um, the clinic visit when we normally have their assessments. Awesome. And then uh, one attendee is asking, do you think that, uh, that the pandemic had an impact on uh, the physical activities that either uh, basically 
people were doing in general, getting out more because they weren't going to uh, to places that they normally would or that made them kind of more uh, willing to participate? Yeah, that, that's a real uh, uh, excellent question in that way, because, you know, people were at home a lot. So that's potentially, you know, something that could confound a little bit of what we did um, in terms of, you know, a lot of people were home more than usual. So they could go walking a lot more than usual or go cycling a lot more than usual. So for sure, I think for that percentage of patients that we did see, it would appear that, you know, they had more time because of the pandemic to participate in, in these activities. So that is um, a, a good observation for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I thought that was, that was a good question. Yeah. Um, so we are nearing the end of our eight minute uh, live section. So if there's anything that you would like to add, this would be a perfect time. Um, and uh, I do appreciate uh, all your hard work. Uh, I know uh, what QI is like, so uh, I can see there's a lot of time invested in that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's from the project we saw that we just need to get our patients to, you know, be engaged in activity. And, you know, we know that body mass index is what we've always looked at to say, oh, it correlates well with lung function. But lean body mass is also something I think we'll be talking about more and more in the future about its correlation to lung function. And if we can help our patients improve their lean body mass by increasing their physical activity, then there's going to be a lot of um, good effects from that. So um, I think, you know, if we can encourage as much as activity as possible, even light, we didn't get to look at light activity in this particular project, but just encouraging our patients to start some activity um, could potentially augment a lot of things and improve their quality of life even, as well as their lung function. So awesome. that's what I'd well, say. Okay, well, thank you. I am going to uh, introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much for participating in the thank live you. today. Thank you so much. So uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. His name is um, David Burwa. I think I got his last name right. And I, and I got to say, when I saw this uh, abstract and read it, I kind of leapt at the chance to hear more about it because um, the idea of doing uh, airway clearance at school is not uh, new for me uh, working in a pediatric center. But what I thought was really interesting is... Um, the level of different types of therapies and uh, and the best therapy at school. So uh, we will get to uh, um, have to have some interesting live questions for David. And um, here is his abstract presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. David Byra. I'm a pediatric resident physician at the John R. Oshai Children's Hospital in Buffalo, New York. I'm also affiliated with the University at Buffalo Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Our research study was daily airway clearance in the school environment, retrospective analysis of a cohort of pediatric patients with cystic fibrosis. I am David, I have no relationships to disclose. We are all familiar with the disease of cystic fibrosis. Approximately a thousand people are diagnosed with this disease each year in the United States. We've seen the median projected um, survival increase over the years. In 2018, those born in that year project, projected to um, lived to 47 years, up from 30 years in the early 1990s, multiple therapies that are utilized. Um, we have inhaled bronchodilators, antibiotics, airway clearance, um, as well as most recently, um, the advent of CFTR modulators. In terms of daily airway clearance, it is recommended for all individuals with cystic fibrosis. There's a variety of techniques. We have high frequency chest wall oscillation devices, positive expiratory pressure therapy, conventional chest physiotherapy, just to name a few. Adherence to airway clearance in children and adolescents can be quite low um, and difficulty exists because of inadequate parental involvement, issues with time management, and just the burden associated with that. Um, adherence has been reported to be below 50% and often self-reports overestimate actual adherence to airway clearance. There's consequences to this, poor lung function and worsening health outcomes. Begs the question, how can we improve adherence? There's been multiple suggestions in the literature, considering home visits, developing community-based initiatives, and in general, just directly addressing individual barriers to adherence. 
Um, I'm just going to highlight a study here. Um, it showed that in a cohort of pediatric CF patients, nebulized therapies were most regularly taken on weekdays during school term time. And the reason I bring this up is that we have, you know, we understand, we see that da daily airway clearance is difficult to sustain in the conventional home environment for a variety of reasons. We also know that children spend a significant portion of day, so why not use a significant portion of their day in school? So why not use that to our advantage? And that's what um, occurred between a, a collaborative initiative between a CF care center in Buffalo and multiple schools in the area to help patients who were not able to complete their airway clearance at home and were having worse health outcomes and worsening lung function. Um, we hypothesized that through this initiative between the CF care center um, and schools that airway clearance completed at school by pediatric CF patients will improve lung function while decreasing pulmonary exacerbation, days of antibiotics, and days of hospitalization. This was a retrospective case control at a single care center. Um, CF patients were less than 18 years of age um, at time of data collection. The absolute time frame ranged from 2012 to 2020. You can see the breakdown here for cases versus controls, 14 subjects in the case group, 36 in the controls. Subjects in the cases were received airway clearance at school for at least one year after self-reported, or in some cases, physician diagnosed inadequate performance at home. So data was collected from one year prior to the start of um, airway clearance at school to one year after. Um, patients in the control were Control group were matched by age and gender and the same time points were used for each match control. Um, so it coincided with the time points in their case um, um, that they are matched to. In terms of data that was collected, descriptive characteristics, um, age, gender, race, CFTR modulator status, multiple different pulmonary therapies, and then different microbiology colonization status is. Um, Outcome variables that we looked at, lung function, specifically FEV1 percent predicted values, and then multiple components of healthcare utilization, um, which we'll talk about momentarily. In terms of statistical analysis, descriptive statistics, we use pair T tests to look at pre and post differences for each group. And then for group differences, um, for continuous variables, we utilize two sample T tests or Man Whitney U tests. Um, for categorical variables, we looked at um, and utilized chi-square test for association or Fisher's exact test um, as appropriate. Here are the subject characteristics. In this table, you can see cases versus controls, very similar in terms of age and gender since they are matched on those components. We see a significant difference in race, which we'll talk about later, um, genotype status, the different, different uh, pulmonary therapies utilized, um, and then different colonization statuses. So we'll talk about it in a second, but significant differences for race, use of hypertonic saline and MSSA colonization. In terms of the first outcome variable, look at lung function. Ultimately 10 subjects were included in the case group while 28 were included in the control group. And this is due to patient ages. We weren't able to calculate FEV1 for, um, percent predictive values. Um, utilizing the different um, you know, Wang and Hanker um, equations that exist. Um, we, as you can see here, the case group had significantly lower um, FEV1 percent predicted values in both the pre and post time or one year time frames. Um, and that there were, when we looked at the pair T tests um, for each of these groups, there were no changes accord, um, throughout those the two years within the groups. Um, when we look at healthcare utilization, um, we'll first talk about antibiotic use. So we broke it down into looking at days of IV antibiotic use, total days of antibiotic use, so including both IV and oral. Um, on the y-axis, you can see number of days over the one year time frames. Um, and then on the x, you can see the different groups. Blue are the cases, orange are the controls. You can see that for cases, um, for days of IV antibiotic days of IV antibiotics um, on average 17.6 in the pre and then nine, almost 10 in the post. Um, Non-significant difference, although nearly significant uh, with using alpha of 0 0.05. Um, so we can see a significant difference between cases post and control post for days of IV antibiotic use. For total days, we saw a significant difference for when we looked at paired t-test um, statistics for cases. Um, went from 47 to approximately 32 
Um, and then when we compared the cases post to the control posts for total days of antibiotics, we saw that there was a non-significant difference between those two groups. In the 12 months prior to initiation of airway clearance at school, um, the control group had fewer um, across all these different components, um, pulmonary exacerbations, total days of antibiotics, days of IV antibiotics, the number of visits to the care center, and then days of hospitalization. We'll look at this other graph here, which is highlighting the number of pulmonary exacerbations requiring IV or PO antibiotics. And that's how we defined a pulmonary exacerbation, whether they ultimately received antibiotics for it. Um, we saw a significant um, reduction in the case group. Um, you can see from on average from 3.6 to 2.6. Um, and then when we compared the cases post to control post, a non-significant difference between those two groups. So over the course of this retrospective time frame, there were significant reductions in the case group for number of pulmonary exacerbations requiring IV or PO antibiotics, the total days of antibiotic use, and then the number of visits to the CF care center. However, there are still significant differences between um, cases and controls for days of IV antibiotics, number of pulmonary exacerbations requiring the IV antibiotics, and days of hospitalization when we compare the post um, cases and post controls. As we go into the, the discussion, um, this is the first study to our knowledge to highlight an initiative between a CF care center um, and schools which utilize um, different airway clearance devices in the school environment to ensure that pediatric CF patients receive adequate airway clearance. Um, and this collaboration ultimately aligns with the strategic commitment by the CF Foundation to identify barriers to treatment and develop solutions um, in order to improve and sustain daily care. I highlighted the differences in the subject characteristics. Um, as we saw race, um, it, you know, it has been noted in the literature that minorities with CF suffer worse health outcomes. Um, there was, you know, when we looked at the, the total number in our retrospective analysis that were 50, the overall prevalence of Caucasian was around 94%, which coincides with what's seen um, you know, nationally and, and worldwide. Um, the, there was, given the small sample size in the cases of only 14, we had a couple of patients that were either African-American or, or Asian um, that ultimately, that we couldn't match um, at the single site in terms of the analysis, um, which resulted in this significant difference. So it's just something to address, especially since um, social situations um, played a role in why um, clearance at home was, was difficult. There was a difference in use of hypertonic saline. Um, the case group had significantly higher use of hypertonic saline, but it kind of coincides with their worst lung function and higher healthcare utilization, which we saw in the data. Um, and then lastly, there was a difference in MSSA colonization. Yet, you know, this bacteria is um, found in a high frequency and healthy subjects, so it's really difficult to prevent or um, understand um, the differentiation from simple colonization from infection. Two notable non-significant differences that I want to point out, CFTR modulators, which have been shown to be highly efficacious um, in improving lung function and reducing exacerbation. So it's, you know, it's good to see that this was not different between the two groups, which improves our confidence in our analysis. And then also there was no difference in MRSA um, status, which has been associated with worsening lung disease, but also improving our, our confidence in what we saw in the, in the data. There was an incongruence between the spirometry um, results and the other health outcomes that we looked at. Um, in general, spirometry testing might not be able to capture a significant change over this relative short period of time, and this has been shown in the literature. Um, I also just want to point out that there was a study that showed that high-resolution CT scans detected structural progression of CF over two years, but the lung function parameters and measures remained unchanged or even improved. Ultimately, this is contributing to the, the literature, you know, aligns with other studies that have been done that have looked at analogous situations. So one study looked at supervised outpatient exercise, and that was associated with a reduction in days of IV antibiotic use. And in essence, that's what, um, you know, this study was about, um, supervised airway clearance at school, you know, in this new environment, um, which was shown to be leading to um, associated with improved health outcomes. I wanna spend some time talking about the components of the collaboration itself. Um, so the interdisciplinary team that um, was comprised of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, 
worked with the family to explore why airway clearance wasn't being completed at home and if the filling was, was agreeable um, to then have it completed at school. The respiratory therapist was integral in this. They worked directly with the um, designated school nurse or employee um, to, make, to facilitate this. The family supplied all the medications that were prescribed and ultimately the CF center provided another device to the school um, so the patient could still complete at home. Um, the main component of this was that res respiratory therapy worked um, very closely with the school and the patient completed teaching sessions at the school consistent follow-up throughout the time frame that therapy was completed in the school. Um, the school employee was instructed to call the CF center with any worsening symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, things like that, that would be associated with exacerbations. Um, and ultimately the care center was notified if the patient was missing significant um, time in school. So barriers could be um, you know, re-identified what was going on at home and, and what, what else the care center could do to try to help, help the patient. But overall, this is what took place with this collaboration um, with the schools and the CF Center. Limitations of this study, obviously there's a small sample size, single site reduces generalizability. Um, the amount of airway clearance um, differed among subjects and varied. Some completed um, one airway clearance at school, some completed two. Um, some of the individual time intervals overlapped with the COVID-19 pandemic at, at which you know, children weren't able to go to school, as we all remember. Um, you know, in conclusion, um, through a collaborative initiative between a CF care center and schools, um, it was shown that airway, airway clearance therapy could be completed in the school environment um, with improved adherence. Um, this resulted in several improved health outcomes and ultimately this provides support for use of alternative strategies such as, you know, this in essence community-based initiative to help pediatric patients with CF sustain um, daily care and sustain um, prescribed airway clearance. So thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to speaking with you on the day um, of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the live uh, Q&A portion. And uh, as a uh, respiratory therapist that uh, works in a pediatric center, the idea of airway clearance at school um, is something that's really interesting to me. I've, I've done a little bit of it, but uh, nothing as comprehensive as, uh, as what you guys have done. So uh, I'm going to start uh, our eight minutes of Q&A. We have some really interesting questions. Um, one that I never thought of was, uh, was it necessary or did you uh, have to uh, address the time that was missed in school learning due to the patient doing airway clearance therapy? Right, so I mean, all, ultimately it's, you know, the, the trade-off, a lot of these kids that we were doing airway clearance therapy in school were missing um, a lot of time. As you saw, there's multiple, you know, missing a lot of days due to hospitalization. So some of them, a lot of them were prescribed the airway clearance for like one one component in school, like 20 to 30 minutes. So ultimately, yes, they were missing time um, while they were getting their clearance because they went down to ultimately the nurse's office who was overseeing the therapy. But, you know, when you take into account, some of them were missing weeks of, of school, especially in that looking back in that year prior to having the airway clearance at school, um, you know, it was certainly a trade-off that, that seemed you know, sensible in, in that time. Certainly. Um, and, uh, and you did make the mention that it was under uh, direct supervision. So they were, they were, were doing that therapy under, uh, under someone that had received training from, uh, from the CF center. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So the you know, respiratory therapists that work at the center work really closely with the designated school employee. In most cases, it was the school nurse, um, how to um, administer the chest, therapy, most cases, the high frequency chest wall oscillation device. Um, and one was the positive x-ray pressure device, like an acapella device. So the nurses um, were work closely with the CF center. Um, the, the main you know, component of kind of what was done was that the respiratory therapist worked with the nurse as well as the, um, the child um, and, and their you know, parent to make sure that what was going to be done in school, how it mirrored what was being done at home um, and ultimately making sure the nurse had comfort in what was being done. Obviously some of them wasn't 
you know, they didn't have necessarily direct um, knowledge related to the therapy prior to um, kind of being briefed in and followed up over time. Um, I know the nurses themselves obviously worked closely with the respiratory therapists, definitely took a lot of, you know, legwork, making sure that uh, what was being done was, was adequate and, and proper. And um, I noticed you mentioned um, mostly it was the vest was, uh, and, and your slide said the vest was provided by the RT. So was that something that the RT made available to the school or did the patient actually have to transport their own equipment to the school for, for use for that airway clearance? Correct. No. So it was uh, an additional vest or an additional device that was provided by the, the CF center so that the family still had their device at, at home so that, you know, the rest of the airway clearance prescription could be ultimately be um, completed. It, it certainly would have been difficult if, you know, going back and forth and, if, you know, sure. if students or if a child was missing school for whether they were sick or just other things coming up in life um, to be able to satisfy that. And um, one question is uh, like uh, oscillating PEP devices, any expiratory devices, and I'm sure that this applies to uh, um, nebulized ne you know, nebulizer cups uh, or any device they inhale and exhale through. Um, was the nurse providing uh, high level disinfection and cleaning for those devices or were those sent home uh, and going back and forth with the patient? They're, they're more transportable, so. Right. No, so ultimately, once again, really came down to the respiratory therapist making sure, um, you know, the necessary thing that was being done, you know, at home, the therapist ultimately was traveling to the school to make sure that was um, completed in tandem with respiratory therapy, respiratory therapy and, and the nurse. Um, I know a lot of it was ultimately the respiratory therapist going to these different schools, you know, in some cases, it all wasn't the same school. So she was, had <laughs> you know, incorporate going to across Western New York um, to, to make sure that, you know, everything was appropriate. So they had to actually transport the, the vest to different schools or did they have multiple vests they were able to give to the schools? They had multiple vests. So like each, each um, patient or, or subject had their own assigned um, device or vest. Excellent. And um, was there any, um, like uh, infection control measures, especially dealing with the pandemic and this being uh, uh, essentially an aerosol generating procedures that uh, protected other students that could potentially be exposed. I know we're normally very concerned about our CF patients getting sick from, from other kids, but especially during the pandemic and doing therapy like this, were they kind of uh, isolated or, or basically placed in a contact isolation area? Um. I guess it's, it's tough for me to say 100% exactly where. I know for most cases they are being done at the nurse's office, which obviously is separate from where kids are, you know, most of the day in their classrooms sure. and all of that. Um, whether it was 100%, you know, isolate and all of that, it's, it's, it's tough to, you know, make sure that was complete just because <laughs> of schools in general and, and what's able to be ultimately, you know, given to the, the students. Sure. And um, were they uh, able to kind of keep up with their regimen on uh, weekends, school breaks? If a, if a patient was missing school, were they were they still able to get, do you think, the same amount of airway clearance in? So it only applied for a couple of the patients that were considered in our case group. Um, one, you know, this happened early when, you know, the coronavirus pandemic happened you know, in March of 2019. Basically, everything was kind of shut off kind of immediately, you know, here in Western New York too. Um, so basically the rest of that initial school year, um, they were, you know, at home and it was still, you know, imparted on them to make sure they, they were completing their therapy um, as prescribed, you know, sure. obviously. So um, the, what was, you know, what was being done at school, it was just made sure that hopefully that they were still being able to do that at home. Granted, that was a difficulty with some of these patients before, hence why that this was being brought to them in a different environment. Um, once again, this only applied for a couple of the, the subjects. And uh, I, I had a question of my own, but actually I think this is, uh, this is the best question and uh, um, something that interests me as well. I think this will be our last question is, uh, how did your CF center get the extra vest systems to hand out? 
because as we know, those are expensive and they can even be hard to get just for our CF patients that, that need them. So that's, that's a, definitely an interesting question. Right. And, you know, I, I don't have a, a great answer for that. Um, you know, in my role that I was doing, you know, along this time, um, you know, being first, I was a medical student and then now being a resident, um, I didn't, you know, I don't hundred percent know where those were coming from, <laughs> although knowing that the, that they were ultimately provided. Um, so not a, a great answer. Um, unfortunately, no, that, but I don't want to misspeak no and, and say something that is not accurate. And just uh, real quick, before I get to my next speaker, were, um, were, were the school nurses pretty okay with this? Did you get much pushback from them or were, or were they actually kind of enthusiastic about it? No, they, they were enthusiastic about it because I know they knew how, you know, with these certain, you know, kids that were missing so much school that it was such an issue at home and the respiratory therapist really worked with them to alleviate any concerns and that there was close follow-up kind of throughout, you know, if, if kids were missing school that was, you know, notified to the respiratory therapist and the respiratory therapist made it known to the nurses, um, you know, things to kind of be looking for on a daily basis um, when these um, therapy was being utilized, you know, were they coughing more, were they, you know, showing shortness of breath at, at school and things like that. And that was ultimately relayed back to respiratory therapy and to the rest of the, the CF team. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for uh, participating in the QA, David. And thanks for, uh, for an excellent talk. Um, we're going to move you. on to our next speaker. Um, this is um, Kaya Hutchins, and her abstract talk is um, Evaluating Potential Differences in the Disease Experiences of Adult Minority Patients with CF. Hi, all. My name is Kaya Hutchins, and I'm an oncology genetic counselor working at Piedmont Healthcare in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my presentation is entitled Evaluating Potential Differences in the Disease Experiences of Adult Minority Patients with Cystic Fibrosis. Um, this project was completed as a part of my master's thesis at Emory's School of Medicine's Genetic Counseling Training Program in collaboration with Emory Healthcare's Adult CF Program. Uh, disclosures, so I did receive funding to support this project from the Georgia Association of Genetic Counselors, which allowed us to pay for uh, gift cards for all of our participants. So obviously I don't need to start off with too much background on cystic fibrosis, um, but I did want to begin by pointing out that CF is a pan-ethnic disease, though it does primarily affect individuals of Northern European descent. So about one in 3,000 Caucasian individuals, one in four to 10,000 Hispanic individuals, one in 15 to 20,000 African-American individuals, and one in about 30,000 Asian-American individuals. And after learning this and sort of doing some more research, and knowing that CF median survival has been improving steadily since the 1940s with the development of modulators such as Trikafta, and then doing some more research figuring out that despite all of these improvements, we're still seeing poor health outcomes in minority individuals with CF. Um, and one of those reasons is that modulators disproportionately benefit Caucasian individuals. So example, for example, about 90% of those with CF are eligible for Trikafta, and the 10% who aren't are largely minority individuals with private mutations that aren't targeted by Trikafta or another modulator that exists. And several studies have been done trying to elucidate some of these different health outcomes and why they're happening. Um, one group in California found that Hispanic persons with CF both have lower overall survival with a mean age of death of 22.4 years versus 28.1 for Caucasian individuals, um, as well as lower lung function than non-Hispanic persons with CF, depending on the region of the U.S. Um, other studies have also demonstrated that minorities in general are underrepresented in clinical trials for pharmaceutical agents for CF, such as modulators, um, with only 19.7% of CF pharmacology clinical trials even reporting the race or ethnicity of their subjects, and even even fewer including them in the study at all. Um, so multiple studies have demonstrated that there's poor quality of life among minority individuals with CF, even after we're accounting for SES and other typical morbidities for lower quality of life. So after exploring this and realizing that there's these really well-documented disparities in health outcomes, but no one can pinpoint why is it it's not genetic, it's not necessarily related to treatments because a lot of them are receiving the same treatments. Is there some subjective or personal factor that's contributing to this? Um, and from my research, no studies had explored the more subjective disease experiences of their patients. 
Um, so the goal of the study was to really to characterize the experiential disease perceptions of minority individuals with CF by exploring cultural influences um, and trying to identify any factors that might be contributing to a more negative experience. And if we was able to identify any of those factors, use those to develop a foundation for better health care and research practices that can benefit all individuals with CF. Um, so for my methods, I did use a survey uh, using the SurveyMonkey platform with both multiple choice, liquor type, and open answer questions, um, which I may present a few quotes later on that came from those questions. Um, multiple questions in the survey were drawn from the Illness Perceptions Questionnaire Revised, which is a validated survey for several chronic diseases, including cystic fibrosis. Um, and those are in the questions surrounding self-perception of disease. We also asked about experiences with healthcare and quality of care, a support from family, culture, and community, as well as self-comparison to others with CF, where I asked individuals to imagine the average person with CF and compare how they fell in different areas related to that person, better, worse, or the same. Um, and eight of the questions were reverse scored. So we had a five-point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And eight questions throughout the survey were reverse scored to make the scales lean in one direction. So Throughout all of this, lower scores indicate more negative experiences and higher scores indicate more positive experiences. We did have a few exclusion criteria or an inclusion criteria. So individuals had to be 18 years or older with a previous diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, enrolled at Emory's adult CF program and English speaking. Um, for our clinic, there were actually no non-English speaking participants. So uh, this didn't limit recruitment for our study. I also have the statistical analyses listed here, which I don't have too much time to go into detail on, but I'm happy to discuss my choices if anyone has questions. Um, and all of the Likert items were compared both on an item to item basis and on a scale basis, because we wanted to make sure that any summative effects were measured in the scale, but that they weren't washed out just based on the sample size. So moving into results, I do know I have a lot of tables. I promise I'm going to walk you through the results and point out the specific points of interest. Starting with our demographics, we had about 330 possible subjects and 82 completed the survey, so about a 24.8% response rate. And we grouped our participants as either non-Hispanic Caucasian individuals, so we had 70 of those, and minority individuals who we classified as anyone who was not Caucasian or was Hispanic. Because of those documents of disparities between the Hispanic and non-Hispanic groups, we wanted to make sure that we were capturing any of those differences. Um, and we had 12 individuals who fell into our minority category. Um, about 85% of our sample were non-Hispanic Caucasian individuals, which is consistent with the demographics of Emory's adult clinic. Um, and the median age of diagnosis for the NHC cohort was one year of age and two and a half for the minority cohort. Um, if you look, the means may seem a little odd, but we did have a couple uh, adults in the NHC group who were diagnosed in their 50s or 60s. But the only statistically significant difference between the two groups was in education, with the NHC participants having higher education levels overall. And looking at the breakdown of our minority cohort, so we had one individual who was Caucasian, who was also Hispanic or Latinx, one Asian individual, eight Black or African American individuals, and two who reported themselves to be other or mixed. And these are all self-reported race and ethnicity. So diving into some of our survey questions, um, our perceptions of illness questions were drawn from the IPQR and statements with the asterisks were reverse scored. Um, and remember that lower scores indicate more negative experiences. So in this category, we found that minority individuals reported that they had a, uh, reported that they had a less clear picture or understanding of their condition as compared to the NHC cohort. Um, as well as in the perceptions of illness total score overall, we found that minority individuals had a more negative perception of their illness in terms of the way others see them, financial consequences, as well as control over their disease. And if you look across, uh, we do see lower scores for the minority individuals across the board, and that is summed up well in the overall score. For our quality of care measures, we didn't find any statistically significant differences between the two groups. However, in the open answer questions, we did have several minority participants indicate that they believe they were diagnosed later on in life due to their healthcare providers not suspecting CF because of their ethnicity. One participant of self-reported Asian ancestry shared, they didn't think to test me for CF because of my ethnicity. One doctor had to convince the others to test me for it and they thought she was crazy. 
Looking at our cultural and community support scales, we also didn't find any statistically significant statistically significant differences between these two groups, um, either on the item basis or on the scales. Uh, and a com some common topics that emerged across both the NHC and minority groups uh, were lack of public familiarity with CF and how support from their family members, especially individuals who had a healthcare background, made a huge difference in how supported they felt in their disease. Many individuals also mentioned the role of religion in their experience, both in positive um, supporting ways, ha having a framework to understand their disease, or in negative ways with others, with members of their religion blaming them for their illness or blaming their parents' sins for their illness. And finally, the category where we had the most interesting results was in comparison to others with CF. Um, so we can see that minority individuals felt like they had worse representation of uh, in CF research and campaigns, um, with one participant sharing, I hate to say this, but I'm Black, and not too many of us have CF, so I don't get any influence. Um, and interestingly, both minority and NHC participants shared that while they felt they might not be represented as well in research due to their race, ethnicity, or milder clinical presentation, many actually didn't express distress over this and more focused on the fact that they were glad that research was being targeted to people who were more severely affected or the majority of, pa of patients and were hopeful that those treatments would benefit them in the future or that research would turn to focus on them soon. We also interestingly found that minority individuals felt like they had less support from their family and community members, because which we didn't see in the last section that we just looked at, which is interesting. Um, and overall, minority individuals reported um, feeling worse compared to most others with CF as compared to the NHC cohort. So moving into conclusions and some interesting takeaways we had from our data. Um, first being that minority persons with CF had a lower perceived understanding of their disease. And so what we don't know is does this truly equate to a lower understanding or do they have as much knowledge and they're just less confident in their understanding of disease. And this is something that we weren't able to measure since we didn't do an assessment of their knowledge of CF. Um, but it's possible that factors such as limited representation of CF in minority groups um, may lead to some disconnection from the community, distance from ongoing research, and causing feelings of decreased understanding about the disease and new types of treatments. And we think this is something that deserves a much deeper exploration. Secondly, across both groups, we found that individuals shared that a limited community understanding of CF played a negative role in their disease. Um, so we think that this is an area where healthcare providers and advocates alike can support all participants with CF outside of clinic by um, engaging families and communities through education and awareness campaigns about CF. Thirdly, uh, we had mentioned the bias and diagnosis of CF for minority participants. And it is important to note that all, because all of the individuals in the study were over 18 when, uh, or over 18, they were not born uh, prior to the implementation of CF newborn screening in all 50 states. So hopefully this is something that has improved, but I think it does emphasize the importance of standardizing newborn screening protocols to focus on CFTR sequencing as opposed to variant panels so that children who come up with one mutation in CFTR that's identified, but are Asian or African-American, that it can reduce that clinician bias. And finally, minority participants uh, in our study viewed their experience of CF as worse than most others with CF, which I think should not be terribly surprising as we know that there's poorer health outcomes, lower survival, lower lung functioning, and poor overall quality of life. Um, and in the last two years or so, this is something that has really taken a front seat, especially given the events in the country, um, with the murder of George Floyd and all of those different things. And so the CF Foundation has played a big role in trying to step up and prioritize research for communities of color to begin to rectify some of the disparities that I've outlined, um, particularly putting $500 million for gene therapy for rare variants not covered by the modulators yet. Um, so we're making steps in the right direction. Um, and as I mentioned before, while minority participants reported poor representation, many express more survivor's guilt and gratitude for research that is ongoing. Some limitations of our study, we did have a small sample size. We were, were recruiting from one clinic and minority individuals with CF are a small subset of a smaller population. Um, and so unfortunately it wasn't possible for us to compare subgroups within our minority class. 
We know that minorities are not a monolith and there may be unique experiences to each subgroup that may be targetable. So this would be a really good area to expand research on. COVID-19 also influenced recruitment in the way that we did things, introducing some participation bias as we weren't recruiting participants in clinic and doing it virtually. We also only recruited English speaking individuals. And in our study, this didn't limit the number of individuals we could recruit, but if this was replicated on a larger scale, uh, we wanna make sure that we include individuals of all different backgrounds, of all different languages, races, religions, um, just to get good representation of everybody. And then finally, the, the demographics of the survey developers, uh, myself and Dr. Hunt and Eileen, who are part of the, the study team, are all Caucasian. And so it's possible that there's topics that we missed because they're not part of our lived experience. Though we did run our survey by many persons of color, just trying to get uh, all perspectives included. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm sure we'll have some live Q&A, um, but I would like to acknowledge my study team, Dr. Hunt, Eileen Barr, uh, Dr. Belcross, Dr. Ali, and Dr. Wan, uh, Emory's Genetic Counseling Training Program, the Emory Healthcare Adult Staff Clinic, as well as the Georgia Association of Genetic Counselors for providing funding. I'm so grateful that I got a chance to speak with y'all and I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, about my research. Thanks everybody. Excellent, Kaya, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, we will now have uh, our live Q&A. And, uh, Q and, a. and um, I think the, uh, one of the reasons when I looked at this along with my, uh, with my co-chairs uh, that I thought this was an excellent, excellent topic, uh, not just because of the timeliness, but uh, because I work in a large center that has um, a, a fairly large minority population of uh, not only uh, black patients, but uh, non-English speakers. So. Um, I'm going to lead off the questions with with my own. Uh, and uh, did you get any feeling uh, among uh, your staff members or clinicians that they felt like there was a limitation on on our end? I know I feel limited sometimes, especially when either speaking through a translator or uh, talking to a young teenager that speaks English with his parents' presence uh, were pre present there about uh, the care they're receiving. So did your did your fellow colleagues feel like they had some uh, um, perceived limitations about the care they can provide? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And unfortunately, at our clinic at Emory, we don't have any part, any patients who don't speak English as one of their primary language. So uh, primary languages, so that's not a huge barrier within our specific clinic. Um, I would say speaking from my own experiences as a genetic counselor working through interpreters in other clinics, it always puts up some barrier between you and the patient, whether it is personal or the ability and depth that you're able to communicate the treatment options and other information to them. Um, I think that one really important way to combat this or to work towards more effective communication is going to be uh, more effective interpreter trainings. Um, there's many different ways to work with an interpreter. There's ways to do it effectively, especially prepping the interpreter, especially for complex genetic information or treatment information that might not be the most pertinent to the conversations that they have on a daily basis, um, as well as being aware of some cultural components for communities that you work with frequently, such as the American Sign Language and Deaf community or Spanish speaking communities. Okay. Um, did you guys come up with any ideas uh, of how to uh address or en enhance the, uh, the family and community understanding of CF? Yeah, so this was an area that I think I was, we were a little bit surprised to not see significant differences in with our survey. Um, I think that one of the big themes that had come up in the open answer questions, like I mentioned, is people saying, you know, just no one understands what my disease is, especially with COVID, people being in public and getting a side eye for coughing. They're like, I'm not sick. <laughs> well, I am sick, but I don't have COVID. It's not <laughs> anything contagious. Um, so one, some of the things that we had been brainstorming, um, I think especially with COVID, we're all spending much more time on our phones, um, social media campaigns and ways to engage um, the community that's outside of you know, researchers and families and individuals with CF just so that people have a better understanding and awareness of you know, what CF is, as well as the range of features that people can experience. Some people are very severely affected while others are not as severely affected. Um, 
So things like visits to different schools and educating people, especially for schools where there's maybe one or two kids with CF, especially in the elementary age, so they can visit that and go home and say, you know, mom, I learned about, uh, I learned about my classmates illness. Have you ever heard of this before? Sort of spreading the word and getting awareness out early so that people don't have to explain everything anytime they do have to disclose that they have CF. Okay. Um, I think this is a kind of an interesting uh, question since we've uh, introduced so many highly effective modulators, uh, especially just recently. Um, but was there any difference or comments or did you look at whether patients perceived the disease experience changed or improved or was any different after they started um, a highly effective modulator? Yeah, so that's one area that we didn't take any analyses on. We tried to keep our survey fairly short and also anonymous um, so that all individuals would feel comfortable participating. Um, some of the open answer questions people did indicate that their quality of life had changed significantly, particularly since um, starting Trikafta and other modulators, but nothing that we measured statistically between these groups or between individuals who had or hadn't been on modulators. Anna, do you have any suggestions for um, other clinicians or bedside providers on how to um, more posit positively affect um, patients' perceived uh, healthcare outcomes or their uh, their disease? Yeah, I think that one of the one of the areas that my group has talked a lot about is just in a clinical setting, right? Many of the patients who have CF are Caucasian. Many of the providers may be Caucasian as well and having representation of different people in that clinic and making people feel safe and comfortable in the space that they're in, that they have the space to express um, any unique challenges they may be facing with their family or with their community. Um, maybe especially for kids and teens who are sort of coming into their own and trying to figure out their place within their family, within their school, within their community. Um, and asking, CF clinic visits can be long. We all are very aware of that, but just <laughs> taking five minutes to ask, you know, how do you feel about, you know, how you relate to other people? How do you feel like your family is supporting you? Are you having any challenges in your church community or your synagogue community? Um, and sort of expressing support for them, whoever they are, whatever challenges they're experiencing um, and having an open dialogue of, you tell me what your challenges are, you know yourself best, both health-wise and socially. And as a team together with PT, social work, RT, the doctors, the nurses, we're all gonna figure out the best way to support you um, as a person. Awesome. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, um, you said uh, in your talk that uh, the foundation had uh, spent uh, spending quite a bit of money on this. And uh, do you uh, know what their recommendations for outreach for uh, minority communities and people of color are going to be? Or uh, not to put you on the spot, what would your suggestions be to, uh, to try to help these people? And I think your suggestions for, clini for clinicians uh, on a small scale probably apply, but I didn't know if you had any ideas of more of a, of a global or a larger outreach that, uh, that the CF Foundation can look at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think especially given the climate of the last few years and a lot of things that are people are becoming much more aware of. It's a very hot button topic to say, you know, we're going to support diverse communities. We're going to support everyone broadly, uh, but actually holding organizations accountable to implement that into practice is going to be really important as we, as either this quiets down or we move forward and see the ways that even more deeply um, discrimination and uh, minority status affects individuals. Um, I think putting money towards these modulator therapies is going to be a key, um, a key component in getting those effective treatments for individuals with private mutations, which of course is going to be um, scientifically and logistically challenging. Um, I do think that the CF Foundation has done a pretty good job about um, including individuals of all backgrounds in their advertisements and trying to engage people in support groups. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I think just getting people involved in the organization, involved in the bike rides and the runs and everything going on so they can feel a part of the community, feel like they understand their disease and understand that we're all in this together. Everyone is trying to support each other in the best way we can. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kaya, for, for, uh, for participating in the Q&A and for your excellent talk. And uh, I think we're going to move on to uh, to our final 
uh, presentation. And this is from Zoe Kinnenberger, and it is patient and caregiver opinions on airway clearance therapy methods. Hello, my name is Zoe Kennenberger, and I am a second year doctor of physical therapy student studying at the University of Iowa. I am currently studying in Dr. Anthony Fisher's lab. I have no disclosures to report. Cystic fibrosis care teams routinely recommend their patients perform airway clearance, but completing airway clearance can be time consuming or uncomfortable. Several methods of airway clearance are available, but data comparing these methods are limited, which prompted me to investigate patients and caregivers' perceived opinions on airway clearance methods. My goals were to gather opinions about airway clearance usage and its perceived importance, as well as understand patient and caregiver preferences about different airway clearance methods. We designed an anonymous patient and caregiver questionnaire in REDCap and asked respondents to provide information about their past and present medication and airway clearance use. With IRB approval, we enrolled patients or family members at CF Clinic at University of Iowa hospitals and clinics and provided the REDCap survey starting in January of 2021. Respondents provided information on medications, including CFTR modulators, methods of airway clearance used in their lifetime and as well as in the past 30 days, and time spent on airway clearance. Respondents rated positive and negative attributes of each airway clearance method and commented on its effectiveness, comfort, time commitment, and compatibility with other treatments, as well as ranked the importance of each airway clearance treatment they're currently using. To date, our survey has been offered to over 200 patients and families and 56 subjects have been enrolled and completed the survey. 31 male, 25 female with a median age of 18 years and an age range of zero to 75. The first question we asked respondents was which airway clearance forms have they used in their lifetime? The X axis indicates number of survey responses and the y-axis represents different forms of airway clearance. Lifetime airway clearance experience was highest with chest wall oscillation device, followed by manual chest PT, huff coughing, exercise, and PEP device. In this talk, we will refer to high frequency chest wall oscillation as best therapy or best, and oscillating positive expiratory pressure devices as PEP or PEP devices. Many patients had many forms of airway clearance usage throughout their life. And because of that, we focused on some of the most common airway clearance techniques that are in current use. Next, we wanted to know about their past 30 day use to gather more insight about patients' current treatment practices. Past 30 day usage was highest for exercise followed by BEST, Huff Coffeine, and PEP device. Because we gathered information about airway clearance use, we wanted to know if airway clearance methods were associated with gender. The x-axis represents the likelihood that an airway clearance method is associated with a male or a female, and the y-axis represents different forms of airway clearance. The gray lines represents the confidence interval and the black numbers indicate the number of survey responses. We found that men and women used each of the airway clearance forms roughly equally as there was no statistically significant difference. But there were trends associated with vest usage in females and exercise in males. In addition to gender differences, we were curious if differences occurred with age. The X-axis represents airway clearance techniques 
and the y-axis indicates the age in years. Individual responses are marked with black dots. We did not find any statistically significant differences associated with age and airway clearance usage. Manual CPT and PEP devices trended towards younger respondents, but exercise, huff coughing, and vest use were common among all age groups. How much time do they spend? Vest users spend more time than anyone else. The x-axis indicated which airway clearance techniques patients used, and the y-axis represents the amount of time spent on airway clearance per day over the past 30 days. Individual responses are marked in red. We found that vest use was associated with much higher time commitment for airway clearance. Next, we wanted to know what things respondents liked and disliked about different airway clearance techniques. First, we looked at positive attributes. Each row is an airway clearance method and each column is an attribute about airway clearance techniques. We gave a choice of nothing if they didn't like anything about it. Respondents answered this question if they reported any lifetime experience with airway clearance techniques. Best users liked its compatibility with other treatments. Respondents considered aerobic exercise healthy and effective. PEP device users liked its low time commitment. We then asked them about negative attributes. Each row again is a method and each column is an attribute about airway clearance techniques. We gave a choice of nothing if they didn't dislike anything about it. Vest users thought it took a long time. Manual CPT users thought it was uncomfortable and time consuming. Generally, people like to exercise, but it made them short of breath. And PEP users generally liked it, although many thought it was ineffective. Because we found out it was uncomfortable or painful for some people, we wanted to know which locations caused them pain or discomfort. In the table, each row is a site of pain or discomfort, and each column header across the top represents an airway clearance type. The main locations associated with pain or discomfort were in the chest, back, breast, abdomen, and armpits, and were most commonly attributed to best therapy and manual CPT. All these methods can take time and be bothersome, but do people think they're important? We asked them to rank their importance versus other forms of treatments they might be receiving for the CF. We had them rank importance on a scale of zero to 100 with a default score of 50. CFTR modulators were rated as very important. The median value for this was almost 100. This was thought to be more important than any other treatment. Exercise was the next most important treatment, and that was statistically greater than three of the methods shown at the bottom but all of them were shown to be important and rated higher than the default value of 50 out of 100. Now that people are on CFTR modulators, we wanted to know how their airway clearance, time commitments, and perceived importance have changed. Respondents who are currently taking the triple modulator therapy reported airway clearance as less important for maintaining their health and reported the same or less time spent on airway clearance since starting their CFTR modulator therapy. To summarize, airway clearance and exercise are considered important by people with CF, but people had very distinct opinions about each form of airway clearance. The most common methods of airway clearance are exercise and vest therapy. 
best users report greater time commitment spent on airway clearance. Manual CPT had the highest ratings for discomfort and pain, and we think that CFTR modulator therapies might be decreasing the amount of time people are spending on their airway clearance. I would like to recognize members from the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics in helping me with this research project. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Zoe, and welcome to the, uh, to the live Q&A. Uh, as a respiratory therapist, uh, patients' opinions on, uh, on airway clearance are, are important to me. I'm always kind of afraid to ask when they come to my clinic, whether or not it's uh, something that they that they like to do, because I kind of um, know what the answer is. But uh, having a varied opinion and a, and a study like this that kind of shows us that it's not all bad is, is definitely helpful. So um, some of the questions uh, are popping up in the box. Um, and uh, this is something I didn't think of, but it's actually uh, it's kind of spurred some questions of my own is uh, how did you uh, define exercise for your patients? Was that a specific definition? Um, and indeed, were the other methods of airway clearance that you uh, asked your patients about, were those uh, based on a standard therapy routine that you have your patients perform or what is generally considered uh, um, standard treatment for, for those types? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. So um, exercise we defined as just the header vigorous exercise, and then we gave an example of running. So basically we wanted to target the aerobic exercise aspect. Um, and then as far as other um, forms of airway clearance, we kept those headers pretty um, vague and we didn't specify um, exactly like what type or you know, certain um, like standards that they had to do just if they were under the umbrella term of Peptivice or chest PT or et cetera. Sure. Um, for your, uh, your patients that were uh, reporting pain um, with their airway clearance, like the vest or, uh, or manual CPT, especially since that requires uh, quite a bit of technique on the, uh, on the part of the person performing that, that treatment. Um, did you have your RTs follow up to make sure that uh, the fit of the vest was appropriate, that the settings were appropriate, um, that the treatment, uh, the physical therapy type treatment was being done correctly um, or other ways to assess their pain. Yeah, so we had just a survey. So they just filled it out one time when they were um, at the outpatient CF clinic at University of Iowa. So we didn't actually have any follow-up with them at all. Um, the survey was anonymous. So we don't actually know who um, responded with what um, perceived opinions. Um, however, I think looking forward, that would be, um, something that we could address to kind of help, um, increase like patient adherence. And especially with family members, like with young children, a lot of them did the chest PT or vest usage. And that would be something that we could work on to help, um, increase their adherence. And I think too, um, what's, worth noting is that these are patients in your center who have been seen by RTs or PT and have been instructed in either the techniques, proper use of the vest, um, and, and have been assessed. So that's kind of a metric that's, you know, it's, it's a good thing to follow up on, but, you know, for your case, I'm not sure if that's something that, that was required. Um, were uh, nebulized mucolytics, uh, nebulized medications, were those uh, included in the time that it takes to do the therapy? A lot of times they're done um, in addition to something like PET, but they're done at the same time as VEST. So was that time counted separately or was it counted um, the same as, um, as the amount of time they were doing the VEST or, or the other therapy? Yeah, so great question. So we mainly, when we asked them about their time commitments, we asked about the manual CPT, um, the chest VEST, the PEP device exercise and huff coughing. And then when we got to the ratings, like the rankings where they had to rank it between zero and 100, that's when we included um, just how they perceived the importance of the different mucolytics and oral antibiotics and things like that. So we didn't actually necessarily like outright say, um, please include your mucolytic therapy in the time that you spent doing airway um, clearance, but we did ask them how they perceived that overall for maintaining their health. 
though, kind of going along with that, um, most likely uh, medication prep, cleaning and disinfection, getting their equipment out, putting things away, that, that type of thing, um, was not factored in, or is that just kind of included in the overall airway clearance umbrella? Yeah, we would presume, I guess, I would say that if they're, for example, using the vest um, therapy, that not just running the vest, but setting it up, getting ready, putting it on, taking it off at the end, all of that would be included under um, the time commitment that they reported. Yeah, and that makes sense, seeing as how, like I said before, these, these are patients that are seen in your center. They should know how to, to most effectively do their therapy, and that would kind of um, include that in our education. So that would be something that they would see as time spent doing that. Um, as far as like oscillating PEP and PEP devices, do you have just one device that, that you use at your center, but you do education on, or, or were there um, different types? I know, um, and this questioner mentioned it, and in our center, this is true as well, as that uh, younger patients, especially patients maybe younger than eight, have difficulty doing oscillating PEP devices because they don't have enough lung volume to power that device for the proper duration, use PEP devices instead. And they're kind of notorious for, um, even when instructed uh, to reporting a less duration than we typically recommend. Yeah, that's a great question. So I am not, so I'm a physical therapy student. So I actually haven't interacted with the patients in the CF clinic um, as like a provider standpoint. But I do know um, when talking with some of the people in the CF clinic that they use um, multiple different types of PEP devices. And off the top of my head, I don't exactly know what those are, but I know multiple options were given um, under that umbrella term of PEP device. And we have the same approach because a lot of times it's what we can um, get uh, product samples donated to us, what the hospital uses, what the patients have obtained on their own. Um, I think at the end of the day, for the most part, uh, the amount of time spent uh, doing that therapy should be the same. So whether or not they have one type over another, the duration that they spend doing it for the purpose of your study um, should be the same. Um, we uh, do have a little bit of time left. If there's, if there's anything uh, that you would like to add, I think it's a, a, a great topic because uh, as we know, airway clearance is the, uh, is the most amount of time that our, our patients spend um, when they're doing uh, their daily care and uh, saying, um, you know, what they like, what they dislike. Um, something that's interesting to me is um, patients typically view exercise as very effective, but a lot of the studies show that, that exercise is a great adjunct because of the variability, um, we don't um, assign that as a primary type of airway clearance. So do you think going forward, that would be something that uh, we need a little bit more standardization maybe in the type of exercise that we uh, ask our patients to do? Yeah, that's a great point. And I was kind of thinking that too, is I know a lot of the times when we think about CF on um, like airway clearance, we think of the devices and the best therapy and manual chest PT and things that we as providers can uh, give to our patients to do. But I think um, also coming from my physical therapy background, I know the importance of exercise and just getting people moving. And I think especially um, if exercise is incorporated with maybe some of that huff coughing, like they, they're going for a run or they're out in gym class for some of our younger kiddos, and they just stop a couple of times to try to do those um, huff coughing, even though I know it can be, you know, sometimes embarrassing for the um, smaller children, um, that that's a really good adjunct to help um, just increase patient adherence. I know that's a really um, hot topic we talk about in PT school is how can we get our patients to buy in? How can we get them to um, adhere to kind of the recommendations that we've set for them? And I think incorporating exercise or just a healthy lifestyle um, really helps patients be able to achieve um, good functional outcomes. And it's a lot easier for people to want to comply if they have, you know, fun ways of doing airway clearance, such as, you know, being on a sports team or doing their favorite, I don't know, exercise aerobic video on YouTube or things like that. Excellent. So um, we've used most of our question time. I'll ask one other quick question before we finish up. And that was, uh, do you do instruction on uh, active cycle of breathing uh, or autogenic draining 
drainage uh, breathing techniques beyond the huff cough as part because uh, um, I don't then see that those were included as, as part of uh, do you like or dislike feel that it's healthy that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. So for our survey in particular, we um, just asked them about huff coughing. Um, but as far as actual practices in the CF clinic, I am unsure if they do those other forms, but I would assume that maybe they are going on. They're just not under um, one of the like top four or five main airway clearance methods. Excellent. Okay, well, I appreciate uh, your talk, Zoe, and thank you so much for uh, participating in the live Q&A. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. That uh, brings us to the uh, end of our workshop today. So I would like to thank uh, all the attendees for their interest and their participation. I would also like to thank all of our speakers for their presentations and their time. Um, and uh, many thanks to my co-chair, Lauren Lyons. And uh, she didn't know if she was gonna be able to participate or not. So uh, Sarah Hank had also helped in some of the initial setup with uh, selecting the abstracts and uh, helping put this together. So I'd like to extend my gratitude to the foundation for uh, allowing me to take part in this today. And um, I'd like to uh, just once again, thank of all our speakers, the attendees and uh, everybody have a good day. Enjoy the conference.